I'm Ann Bocock, and welcome to Between the Covers. Rick Bragg will make you cry, and he'll make you laugh out loud, and he can do this in the very same book, and that is great writing. As he has shared in his writing previously, he started life dirt poor in rural Alabama, and for most young men, that probably meant a job at the cotton mill. Instead, he became a Pulitzer Prize winner and author of 12 books, including the best-selling Ava's Man and All Over But the Shouting. His latest book is about Speck, a half-blind stray dog, and in his words, a terrible boy. Like his other books, it's a Southern story at its heart, and the words are like pure magic. Please welcome the author of The Speckled Beauty, Rick Bragg. Hi, Rick. Oh, thank you. That was awful nice. I appreciate that. I just, before we even get into the book, can we just say that even though there are parts of this book that made me cry, the dog does not die in this book, okay? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I... I, I I said before I even got started on this, I was not going to do a book where the, you know, the dog dies in the end because, you know, there's that awful arc, you know, the short arc of the dog's life and the longer arc, you know, of its owner's life, usually, not, not always. And I, I just don't think I could have, I could stand that. You know, I just didn't think I could stand doing that kind of book. So, uh, Speck had to survive. Now, I'll admit, we kept a pretty close watch on him as the book got near its end because I spent about three years on that sorry rascal trying to, to write his story. On the cover of the book, and it, there's this gorgeous Australian shepherd, and this is not what the dog looked like when you rescued him. You've got to tell us how he came into your life. Well, I, I'm a little bit ashamed of, of how long it took me to, I guess you'd say, rescue the dog. Uh, but um, he had, had been running with a pack of, you could call them wild dogs. You call them stray dogs uh, out here in the country. Uh, you know, they live in the pine barrens and in the ditches and they eat out of the garbage cans and they kind of live on gopher snakes and rats and, you know, and eggshells. And, and they, we have saved many of them over the years, uh, you know, dozens of them over the years. But you, you can't save them all. And so they kind of become invisible after a while. And I had seen this dog fighting. He was uh, appeared to be the leader of this pack of dogs. And, and then one day I didn't see him. And some time went by. And I, when he reappeared, he was up on the ridge line behind the farm. And he... He was cut up and chewed up and starved down to nothing. I mean, he should weigh between 60 and 70 pounds. And you know, he, 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 he weighed nothing. And um, my conscience got the better of me. I, I went up the hill and uh, uh, sat down and he lick my hand and well that's about all it took i guess and i carried him back down the hill and over the years have had many chances to regret that but i think he had gone up there to die he um he went up there to to make a place and it was heartbreaking because from where he was on the ridge line he could see uh, the other dogs in our yard. We had two more at the time, and and he could, you know, see my mother bring out food for them. And he could see 
her feed the terrible cats and he could see the livestock, you know, in the pasture, all things. And he could see the people come and go, you know, things that would have been normal to a, to a dog if that dog had not been discarded, had not been thrown away. Rick, I want to pivot to your mother for a minute, if I could, um, because you talked about your mother. Your your mother is this, what is the word, remarkable woman. And in one of your previous memoirs, you talk about her, I think she went 18 years without buying a new dress because she had to clothe you and, and your brothers. Well, she's really prominent in this story this story about speck there is some there is this relationship that speck has with your mother through food and this is a beautifully <laughs> written passage and it just made me smile if you would indulge us and just read that please sure sure he uh yeah he he, he would walk over my dead body to get to a biscuit Here's a little uh, explanation of all that. For a week or so, the new dog rested, healed, and ate everything my mother put in front of him. He ate leftover beef roast, bacon, hog gel, and pork chops with the bone cut out. He ate short ribs and hamburger. He could eat six hot dogs and wine for more. But he also ate butter beans, English peas, and baked sweet potatoes, and cold biscuits as fast as we could throw them into his mouth. He ate pounds of cornbread, catfish, potato salad, and pinto beans. He ate collard greens, stewed squash, and fried okra. My mother picked roast chicken off the bone for him and cooked him scrambled eggs. She fed him sausage biscuits and a plate of deviled eggs I'd had my eye on all day. He lapped up milk and buttermilk and chicken noodle soup. I told her that this much people food was probably not good for the dog, for any of us, most likely. And she lied and said she wouldn't do it anymore. I watched him chew on a ham bone the size of a balled up fist till it just disappeared. He was not fond of onions unless battered and fried or cucumbers or pickles of any kind unless in a cheeseburger. But that was the litany of things he would not consume. He wore chili in his whiskers and hush puppies on his breath. You could almost see him heal like some kind of time-lapse photography. By the second week, he was ranging a little stiff-legged around the farm. One day in his second week, he limped over to watch the donkeys, Buck and Mimi, and the great black mule, Bella, as they ate from the trough by the upper pasture gate. He seemed fascinated by them. Livestock. It was like he knew they had something to do with him somehow. If he could just remember what that used to be. He eventually left his place in the garage and lay instead just outside the gate so he could see them better, as if he were on some kind of mission. But he never bothered them, just seemed to study them. I surprised myself those days at how much of my time that dog soaked up. I always worked in manic spurts, and lately I had worked 20 hour days, seven days a week. I didn't have time to fool with a dog. A lifetime ago, I'd been one of those little boys who would run around all day with a broken bird in a shoebox, expecting a miracle. Then, when all hope was lost, I buried it in the yard with a tablespoon. Not much use for a boy like that for such a long, long time. Now, every time I walked through the door, he was waiting for me and made every step I made. 
He was gentle with my mother, never jumping on her or begging for food, even if she had bacon in her hands. It was as if the dog that ran and fought in the ditches had washed away on that ridge line. Why, he's just a big baby, my mother said, rubbing his head. His tail wagged so hard it moved his whole backbone. Let me see, she said, if I can find you some baloney. Yeah, yeah, that was your mother's dog, I'm telling you. you. You also, in this book, these are your words. You say, Speck is not a good boy. He is a terrible boy. So I think for people that haven't read the book yet, do you want to give us a glimpse into how terrible he was? Yeah. Um, I guess the worst thing he does is, um, and, and he can't help it, I guess. Uh, but, you know, he's a herding dog. But because of the bad eye, he he tends to herd in a circle. So he will just start a stampede, you know, biting at the legs of the, the animals and then herd them in this never ending circle. I, I think in the book I said like a like a drunk teenager doing donuts in a parking lot. And it's never ended, you know. They they don't know where they started, and they don't know where they've been, and they don't know where they're going to, and they just run. And he runs them until they are out of breath and about to collapse. He, you know, he 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 attacks the the UPS driver, and he attacks the the FedEx man, and he doesn't bite them. He just terrorizes, and and. He ate an entire um, uh, set of bedclothes, and and you know it, 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 he bites me when I try to take him to the vet. He doesn't hurt me. He just does it to show me that he doesn't want to go to the vet. So uh, and we could go on. We you know we could we could you know finish up this century talking about the things that dog does wrong. Rick, the book is dedicated to your older brother, Sam, and my condolences. We have all people, all of us who, who read you have come to know him through your stories. In this book, he Sam didn't really like the dog. He didn't want the dog. So how did that turn out? Well, it was, you know, we were talking about, you know, how dog books are, can be so sad because, you know, the dog perishes. And, and it's just the way that, that life will do you. Uh, my brother Sam, uh, two years ago, got sick with uh, pancreatic cancer. And he had been the, the most indestructible human I'd ever known. He was... Um, the last real Southern man. But before he got sick, he um, he was just disapproving of Speck. He believed that dogs, he raised hunting dogs, and he believed that dogs should work for a living. You know, dogs should have some purpose. They should not come in the house. They should not get on the couch. They, you know, they should work. And, um, and he would like even, you know, he I don't think he meant anything evil by it, but he'd even spit on Speck's head with a big chew of tobacco if Speck got too close to him. And um, I'd tell him not to, and we'd almost get in a fist fight. Grown men out in the parking lot. Uh, and and then he got sick. And he got weak. And he would sit for long hours in the in the yard. And you know, I, I guess I shouldn't have been surprised, but you know, dogs, good dogs know when someone is hurt. And uh, Speck 
just would go sit beside my brother. And at first they would just sit there together, just kind of in this uh, uh, chilly uh, uh, detente. And, and eventually my brother's hand would creep closer and closer. And then one day I looked outside and he was sitting there with his hand on Speck's head. And, and, you know, that was the beginning of him saying things like, you know, Speck uh, wound up running off uh, some coyotes. And uh, that was the moment where Speck all of a sudden had value to my big brother. And, uh, and I remember Sam saying, uh, they won't come around here no more. You've got a real dog now. Uh, and yeah, it, it, you know, the last thing in the world I expected to do uh, when I started a book on the dog was to have to write about, you know, my brother getting sick. And Rick, it, it was it was truly an, an important part of, of this book. This book is so honest. And Sam wasn't the only one. You are very honest in this book about yourself. You had non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, which led to chemo brain and depression. And at the very beginning of the book, you tell us that you have moved home because you you need to be, you need to help your mother. You're you are this best-selling author who's now living in his mother's basement. And as you put it, you're 11 steps from the bed to your office. This was a difficult time. Yeah. So who rescued who? Did you rescue Speck or was it the other way around? Well, I, I think, um, I think a lot of people say that, you know, that the dog rescued them. I think a lot of people, uh, and, and they're, and they're, you know, just because, a thing kind of becomes a cliche doesn't mean it. it's not true. And uh, I think Speck definitely, you know, I came home uh, for a lot of reasons. Uh, I have an old house in, in Fairhope, Alabama, down, you know, a stone's throw from the Florida line. Uh, you know, uh, but I don't really get to go. Uh, I don't get to go down there. I love the fish. I love the Gulf. I love being down there. And, um, but I don't really get to go. Uh, I, I am where I need to be. And and um, as I say, you know, because, you know, Southerners love to be, you know, we love to be Gothic, you know, and, and speak in Gothic language. And, and I remember saying more than once, uh, you know, I, it's not that I don't love where I'm from, but I, I always, you know, I got to see a lot of this world. I got to see Central Asia. I got to see the Middle East. I got to see Africa. I've, you know, seen Haiti in times of unrest. And uh, I've seen a lot of this world. Um, but I guess I always kind of knew that I'd never get out of this red dirt alive. And there's nothing wrong with that. This is one of the most beautiful places on earth. But you can still feel a little trapped. You can still feel um, that inertia. And this dog, this stupid dog, this this, you know, nasty, smelly, badly behaved dog changes all that. Um, McMurtry, Larry McMurtry, one of my favorite writers who passed just a year or so ago, um, said that some men, some people are just born beside a river of melancholy. And they never, no matter where they go or what they do, they never get away from that river. They can always hear that river kind of rushing by. And um, and if you are trapped beside a river like that, and I think a lot of us feel that way sometimes, then you, um, 
you need a bad dog. You know, a good dog is a great thing to have on a good day. A, a good dog is a great thing to have on an easy day when your mind is easy. But man, on an empty day or a bad day, you need a bad dog. You need a dog that will rip it hard up. A bad dog. You know, during the pandemic, a lot of us adopted dogs, including me. Mine, I have to dare say, was a lot cleaner and more well-behaved than yours. But would you hope that one takeaway from the book is perhaps that people would, would open their doors, open their hearts, and, and give a dog a chance? Just think, if all of us went out and picked up one bad dog, just one bad dog, not only do you rescue the dog, there wouldn't be any running in the ditches here. There is something about Southern storytellers, and I, I can say this because I was born and, and raised in the South. There's a quote that I found, and it's from a philosopher, William James, who said, common sense and a sense of humor are the same thing moving at different speeds. A sense of humor <laughs> is just common sense dancing. And when I read that, I thought, isn't this Southern storytelling? I think it has to be. Yeah, I think maybe we're just not right in the head. Um, so, you know, Southerners, Southern writers love to pretend to be, you know, a little bit off. But the, the older I get, the more I realize that there seems very little pretension in it. You know, I'm just not quite all there anymore. I'm not sure I'm going to buy that. And in just the little bit of time that, that we have now, true or false? And this is coming out of left field, has nothing to do with this book. But is it true that a Haitian voodoo priest tried to turn you into a goat? Yeah, but they tried to do many other terrible things. I was there when the military, backed by uh, some of the richer folks in Haiti, uh, kicked President Aristide out of the country. And then I went back when uh, the U.S. military uh, came in to reinstall Aristide as, as the president. And the... Um, um, came down the case of good guys and bad guys to me. And the, the bad guys uh, hired the voodoo priests to, uh, it's kind of psychological warfare, a kind of intimidation, and they would do hexes and things on the sidewalk. And, and one of them, uh, seeing my notebook and, you know, uh, you know, kept shaking this thing at me that appeared to be uh, like a chicken foot with some beads on it. And uh, my uh, one of my the folks with me said, I think he's trying to turn you into a goat. And it, as far as we can tell, it is not successful. <laughs> I'm going to leave it at that. It may just be taking a while. This book is a love story. It is the speckled beauty, a dog and his people. Rick Bragg, this has been a pleasure. Thank you. No, it's it's been my pleasure. And pet Jack for me. I will. I'm Ann Bocock. Please connect with us. You can listen to our podcast, Go Between the Covers, wherever you get your podcast. And please join me on the next Between the Covers. <laughs>